Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, Matthew 16, 24. That's where we begin today. Get your Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 16. You can study God's Word with me, any part of God's Word, as much as you want, any time that you want, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website. The same way we're going to do today, using my audio Bible messages, and it's found at the thebibleversebyverse.com. There you will find four complete series going through every verse of the Bible, going back 38 years, going on five, actually. It's all there for you to choose, click, and listen. Again, that is at thebibleversebyverse.com. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Matthew 16 Verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. To the disciples and to the Jews in general, the cross represented trouble. The cross meant suffering and shame and death and the worst type of disgrace. Jesus will endure all those things in order to pay for our sins. And if we want to be pleasing to Christ, if we want to be his disciple, if we want to be saved, then we must be willing, willing I say, to die to self, because that's a good summarization of what Jesus is talking about, die to self. You say, I won't have any trouble being a Christian, being saved, because I don't plan on being crucified. There's no crucifixion, so I'm I'm a shoe-in. No, it's not. No. The point is, you've got to be willing to die to self and put Jesus first. In other words, Throw your self will right out the window and yield completely to the will of Jesus Christ. So that's what it means. It means to live as Jesus lived, whatever the outcome might be for us. It also means being full of mercy and compassion to everyone because he was, even at your own expense, even to those who are not good to you. It means be willing to endure shame and suffering and poverty and even death if that's what it takes to follow Christ. He who endures to the end shall be saved. That's not salvation by works. That is salvation by faith. But if you truly have saving faith, if you have truly repented and received Christ as Lord and Savior, then you have received the Holy Spirit and you will be that way if you are saved. 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. In other words, let go of self-will and be willing to put Christ first, or you will lose your soul. 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Some people are way too busy to think about Jesus. Some people are pursuing careers or friendships or relationships or wealth and they simply don't want Jesus interfering in their plans. Oh, they know about Jesus. And they know what he demands, but they are not willing to submit. And of course, sometimes to keep a friend, you have to say or do things contrary to God's word. So some people shut Jesus out for the sake of friends or husband or wife or career or promotion. Shut Jesus out. Uh Uh-uh. Not going that route because it's going to cost me. Okay. 
You're going to lose your soul. It's going to cost you your soul if you persist in that. Some people just keep pursuing the things of this world and they never seek Jesus. And so they end up in hell. It won't happen to me, you say. It will happen to you. In fact, it's as good as done right now. If you died right now and that's your attitude, you'd go straight to hell. Don't tell me it wouldn't happen to you. The Word of God doesn't make an exemption for you. Jesus does not make an... He doesn't have your name in here, does he? Oh, except if your name is John Doe or whatever your name happens to be. You're going to go to hell if you don't make Jesus Christ not just your Savior, but your Lord. Oh, you gain this world for what it's worth, but you'll lose your soul. 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Jesus will reward you for putting him first. The immediate reward for selling out to Christ is a deep inner joy that comes from a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your Creator through the Savior. And that's a wonderful thing. That's worth more than anything if you've ever experienced it. But another reward is eternal life. And to follow that, eternal rewards. 28. Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This was another startling statement from Jesus. And Jesus is actually talking about what will happen in chapter 17. So let's read verse 28. And then chapter 17, verse 1. Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death, will not die, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, now let's read chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain privately. Peter, James, and John had a special relationship with Jesus. Out of all the apostles, the twelve apostles, these three were his inner circle. He was a, Jesus was especially close to these three apostles. So he took them up with him into this mountain. So there they are, the four of them. But notice, too, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine like the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. From the time that Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb, he had always been God in the flesh. And up to this point, the glory of God, which reveals itself in a brilliant light, had been covered by his human body. Here, though, the veiling power of Jesus' flesh is lessened just enough for the apostles to see the glory of God shine through him, just beaming out of Jesus from the inside out. Three, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Moses and Elijah had been dead for centuries. But notice, they are still who they were. Moses and Elijah. When you die, you don't lose your identity. You will always be you. For Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three booths. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Good idea. Moses and Elijah were spiritual superstars to the Jews. So to have Jesus and Moses and Elijah there all together was an amazing thing for the apostles to see. And Peter didn't want it to end. And I don't blame him, so he offers to make each of them a tabernacle or a booth. Sort of like a hut made from the branches of trees to keep off the heat and the cold and the rain. 
And at first, Peter is not sure that he or John or James should even be there, I think, you know. But those three should stay there. Look at verse 5. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Well, in Peter's excitement, he kind of, not, not, not kind of, he did. He put Moses and Elijah on the same level as Jesus, which should not have been done. So God the Father immediately corrects Peter here, reminds Peter, and us too, that Jesus is the preeminent one. So they're told to listen to him. The Father didn't say, listen to Moses, Elijah, and, and my son, Jesus. No, he singled out Jesus because Jesus is God's son. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face <clears throat> and were very much afraid. They heard the audible voice of God. That's the same voice, by the way, that said, let there be light, and there was light. So the apostles hit the dirt. Seven, and Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And this was the value of having Jesus on your side right here. And it will be too for us if we're saved. Because when you are standing before God the Father on Judgment Day, and you will, Jesus will be right there next to you saying, It's okay. And he'll tell the Father, You belong to him. Just like he's telling the apostles here, don't be afraid. It's okay. You'll need that reassurgent. What's the word? Reassurgent? I can't say the word. You'll need that reassurance. Thank you very much. You'll need that on Judgment Day, standing before Almighty God. Verse 8. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. Again, it was just Jesus and the three apostles, just like before, because Moses and Elijah were gone. Nine. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be raised again from the dead. Well, <clears throat> if the Jews, you see, would have heard about Jesus lighting up with the power of God, they would have made Jesus king of Israel right on the spot. You say, well, isn't that a good thing? No, no. Jesus tells the apostles not to say anything because it would just complicate things as he heads for the cross to pay for our sins. In other words, they're supposed to keep quiet about this until after his resurrection. You say, well, why wouldn't he want them to know now and make, them, make him king right now? Because they were looking for a political messiah. Not a spiritual Lord, not the Son of God who they were to repent and, and make Lord and Savior. Plus, he had to die for their sins. But even apart from that, they, they wanted a political Messiah. That's all they were looking for. And that's not why Jesus came. He came to save souls, not to deliver the nation Israel from Rome. 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? Well, the prophet Malachi is what they're referring to. Last book in the Old Testament foretold that Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, would return. He would return to earth before the Messiah came on the scene. 11. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. In other words, yes, the prophets were right, Jesus says, when they prophesied that Elijah was returning and that he would restore all things, meaning that Elijah would restore the right attitude and would correct the people's thinking and that he would preach a straightforward message which would wake people up, spiritually speaking, before the Messiah came actually and was introduced to the world. Jesus says that's exactly what the Bible teaches. And then he goes on to say this, 12, But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they desired. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. Jesus says Elijah already came, did his job, and he was murdered because of it. 
And Jesus says, the same thing's going to happen to me. And Jesus' description of Elijah, who was to come, fit John the Baptist perfectly. John the Baptist fulfilled those prophecies about Elijah because John dressed like Elijah. He lived like Elijah. He preached like Elijah. John came in the spirit and power of Elijah and preceded the Christ, just as the Old Testament said would happen. We'll stop there. Study all of God's word with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com. To be a part of this ministry, pray for me and God's word. Please do it right now before you get. Write a note. Forget. Write a note. Put it on the refrigerator door. Pray for Mike. Pray for God's word. Keep praying. Also, when you take a break from studying with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the donate button, prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That also makes you a part of this ministry. Thanks for studying with me. See you next time. Until then, so long.